culture differentiates into total possibilities because you see reality is made up of subjective consciousness so what we're talking about is all possibilities from all subjective consciousnesses dictating culture dictating reality because that is what a quantum fluctuation is due to the observer effect Last time I said that the most important thing to keep in mind when trying to distinguish between quantum physics and the pseudoscientific abuse of it is that even if we know nothing about the subatomic world, we'd still know plenty about the macroscopic. But how can that be? Well, you have to remember that classical physics came first, and it provides a very good description of the macroscopic world. The equations of quantum physics were derived with this in mind, so that whenever really large numbers are plugged in, the results must match those of classical physics. This is known as the correspondence principle. It means that, technically, we can throw out classical physics. The only reason why we don't is that using the equations of quantum mechanics instead would be needlessly complicated. We know they're going to give the same results at macroscopic scales, so why not keep it simple? What this means is that quantum physics can never be used to predict that the weirdness of the quantum scale world also applies at larger scales. In this video, I want to try to show you how this works using another thought experiment. Before we begin, yes, I know I'm oversimplifying things. The intended target audience is people who haven't studied this stuff, the people who might potentially be fooled by the quantum mumbo-jumbo peddlers. The point of this video isn't to teach quantum physics, but to help people tell the difference between the real deal and the pseudoscientific nonsense. This thought experiment is intended as an analogy only. Now, you're in a dark room. You have a set of dice with you, but they're not ordinary dice. For one, they glow in the dark. And for another, they're slightly rounded, so that the slightest touch could make them tip over. You also have a measuring stick with you, and that too glows in the dark. Now, take a die and throw it as hard as you can. It'll bounce off the walls and come to rest somewhere on the floor. Now I want you to make two measurements. I want to know the distance between the die and your current position. And I want to know which side of the die is facing up. Because of the lighting conditions, you can only see where the die is. You have to walk over to it to see what side is facing up. Once you do that, you can no longer know exactly where you were standing, so obviously you have to measure the distance first. Of of course, when you measure the distance, you'll have to reach out with a measuring stick until it touches the die, likely tipping it over. Again, because it's dark, you won't be able to see how the die rolls. You'll only be able to see that it moves. You know, you could just leave the stick to mark Shut up, standing. I know it's not a perfect analogy. My point is that you're in a situation where in order to make one measurement, you have to give up the ability to make the other. This is a reality of quantum physics, described by what is known as the uncertainty principle. Making measurements requires you to interact with very tiny and very sensitive things, and any interaction will have an effect on the object being observed. For example, trying to bounce a beam of light off an electron in order to detect its position would be like trying to locate a baseball by swinging a bat. Sure, you're going to find the ball, but you're going to send it flying. Now tell me, how fast was it moving before you hit it? This leads to a very important point. It's the interaction that affects the object being observed. It's a physical interaction. It has nothing to do with particles knowing that 
they're being observed by an intelligent observer or something like that. The observer is simply that which interacts with the particle. It doesn't matter if it's intelligent or not. So getting back to our thought experiment, you can't know everything about the die. You can know the distance to it or the number it shows, but you can't know both. But here's what you can know. The likelihood of a given number showing and the likelihood of the die landing a given distance away from you. Assuming that it comes to a rest in a totally random position and that all six numbers are equally likely, the average values, well, the technical term would be expected values, are that the die comes to rest at the center of the room and shows a 3.5. Either value can deviate, of course. In fact, we know that since there is no 3.5, the number shown will deviate from the expected value. But the probability of a deviation in one direction is exactly the same as that of a deviation in the opposite direction. This won't matter if we throw one die, but it will matter if we throw a lot of them. Now, throw a very large number of dice. They'll form a loose distribution with its center near the center of the room, and the total number showing will be close to 3.5 times the number of dice. Why? Because if the number of dice used is high enough, anything else would be so unlikely that the probability approaches zero. Statistically, we should see as many dice showing 1, 2, or 3 as 4, 5, or 6. We should see as many in one corner of the room as in the opposite corner. The average will match the expected value if the number of dice used is high enough. Now, we can measure the distance to the rough center of the distribution, and it doesn't matter that we tip a bunch of dice over as we do this. As the dice tip over, some will turn to a lower number, but others will turn to a higher number. On large scales, this means that the uncertainty cancels out. The expected value stays the same. The point of all this is that we can know the total number and the position of the whole set of dice within a relatively small margin of error, even though we can't know both properties of the individual die. In the same manner, hitting an electron with a beam of light will affect it so much that we change some of its properties. But hitting a car with a beam of light, well, sure, we'll change the properties of the particle we hit, but the effect on the car as a whole is completely negligible. So, I hope this has given you some insight into why Anyone who suggests that quantum weirdness also applies at large scales, or that the observer creates reality, is talking out of his ass. But quantum physics still proves that God exists. In fact, there's a video on YouTube that presents irrefutable scientific proof of this. Really? Well, I guess that means it's time for a Ponage edition next time. See you then.